So this is our uh, agenda. Good morning. And uh, it's not only about viral hepatitis. Uh, another uh, focus of this conference is on non-alcoholic and alcoholic fatty liver disease. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, the abbreviation is NAFLD. And it's very common, but the term focuses on the liver. But there's always a close correlation between non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and diabetes and cardiovascular uh, uh, diseases. And, but we, are, we are still need additional data. And we have chosen two um, very interesting studies that establish a link between liver disease and diabetes, uh, as well as cardiovascular diseases, respectively. The first study is interesting. It's from Japan. It's from Asia. And they recruited uh, more than 3,000 participants and stratified them into two groups. So there was one group of patients with non alcoholic fatty liver disease and another group, uh, uh, another control group. And then they followed these patients prospectively over 10 years. And you can see here on the right that some patients improved and others did not improve. So overall, there were three groups, patients without non alcoholic fatty liver disease, then patients with uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and some did improve and others did not. And then they performed a statistical analysis, and the group could show that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease at baseline is a significant risk factor for diabetes. And we all know traditional risk factors such as family history uh, or sex or body mass index, and they are listed here, but the most prominent uh, risk factor in this cohort was non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So the liver points to the risk for diabetes. And now the key question is, of course, when the liver function improves, when non-alcoholic fatty liver in function improves, does this again correlate to the occurrence of diabetes? And here you can see that improvement is highly significantly sig correlated with uh, diabetes incidence also during follow-up. So the liver improvement is associ associated with a reduction of incident diabetes. So this interesting study from Asia, a large study establishes a link between non alcoholic fatty liver disease and diabetes. So I have also pointed to the risk of uh, cardiovascular diseases, in particular atherosclerosis, and this is the second study that we would like to highlight. It's from the FLIP consortium, a large consortium in Europe, um, led by Vlad Razio from uh, Paris, and the group looked at the impact of NAFLD now on atherosclerosis. And they used a score, the Framingham score. You might remember that the Framingham cohort uh, is one of the key uh, population-based cohorts in uh, the US that established risk factors uh, for atherosclerosis. And in this FLIP study, uh, the uh, authors looked at a population at high risk of cardiovascular uh, events. And they correlated the progression of atherosclerosis um, um, in a, in, in, in a long-term follow-up. So again, they stratified the cohort into two groups, similar to the diabetes study. So there are patients with NAFLD, 1,800 patients, and then there are patients without NAFLD, 3,800. And you can see that they were comparable. But then again, at the bottom, highlighted in red, you can see the classic indicators of cardiovascular risk, which is the sickness of the intima, um, and uh, you can also <coughs> quantify carotid plaques, and you can see that there was a significant correlation again. So the presence of NAFLD uh, is a signpost for the occurrence of atherosclerosis, and this was also reflected by a significantly increased Framingham score. So the authors concluded that NAFLD is highly prevalent in patients at high risk for cardiovascular events. So looking at the liver points to your cardiovascular risk. Patients with NAFLD had higher intimus sickness. The abbreviation stands for intimus sickness and Framingham score regardless of the liver and some activities. NAFLD is a predictor of atherosclerosis independent of the classic risk factors. So the liver adds additional information to assess the risk for atherosclerosis. So I would like to summarize um, these two key uh, presentations. NAFLD is a significant long-term risk factor for the development of diabetes, the first study from Japan. 
And then in patients at high cardiovascular risk, NAFLD contributes to the progression of early atherosclerosis independently of the traditional risk factors. So the liver adds additional new information. And these studies contribute to a strong body of evidence showing that NAFLD poses a cardiovascular risk above and beyond that conferred by traditional risk factors. So you have to take into account the liver when you assess the risks for diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So now, for the second part of the presentation, we return to a molecule, and we all have to learn new names, and, and this is, uh, the name is obeticolic acid, and we highlight here uh, many benefits for liver disease, potential benefits of obeticolic acid. So obeticolic acid is a bile acid, and I sneaked in one slide with additional information about bile acids, because one of your major bile acids in your body is chenodeoxycholic acid, and this is shown in the middle. It's uh, a product of cholesterol, so chenodeoxycholic acid, your major bile acid, the, the root bile acid. And then on the right you see ursodeoxycholic acid, which is widely used for the treatment of liver diseases, and this is the main bile acid of the bear. And then um, uh, uh, a very uh, a chemist, you need chemists now, Pelliciari, he synthesized obeticolic acid, and you can see on the left that it's related to chenodeoxycholic acid, and it has an additional group on there indicated by the red um, uh, symbol. And this slight change, this chemical adaptation, this uh, uh, chemical modification, turns this compound into a very potent FXR agonist. So we have to learn two things. First, obeticolic acid, a bile acid, and then FXR. FXR is a transcription factor, and it's your central bile acid sensor of the body. So it's the sensor, a transcription factor that, that measures, in principle, your bile acid levels. And it's located both in your intestine and the ileum, in, in the liver. So it's a central bile acid sensor of the liver, and obeticolic acid is a very potent agonist of this central bile acid sensor. Now, you will see several presentations, very interesting presentation at, at uh, this RLC, uh, looking at the effects of obeticolic acid, this bile acid derivative, on different diseases. And here I highlight the long-term treatment of PBC, primary bile cirrhosis, with uh, obeticolic acid. This was um, a 12-week phase two double-blind placebo-controlled study evaluating the effects of obeticolic acid in 59 patients with PPC. And obeticolic acid produced highly significant improvements in alkaline phosphatase and other biochemical markers compared with placebo. So when we look at, er uh, at PBC, most of those patients receive ursodeoxycholic acid treatment, but not all of them respond. So we definitely need new treatment options was a subgroup of PBC patients who do not respond to ursodeoxycholic acid. The controlled period was followed by an open-label uncontrolled long-term extension, which is presented here, in which patients either continued obeticolic acid treatment or switched from placebo to obeticolic acid, as shown at the bottom end. The long-term extension phase remains ongoing, and data being presented include patients treated with obeticolic acid for up to three years. So we now, in this study, see the effects of obeticolic acid for a long-term period up to three years. The results are shown here. Long-term obeticolic acid treatment given both as monotherapy and in combination with ursodeoxycholic acid maintained a durable response during this three-year period. Improvement in serum levels of alkaline phosphatase and other hepatic enzymes were maintained over three years, and alkaline phosphatase levels at baseline decreased significantly. So now there is one common side effect, uh, um, adverse event, which is pruritus. But interestingly, in this study, and I will show you additional data, the severity of pruritus diminished with continued therapy. So beticolic acid represents a potentially new treatment options for patients with PBC, either as monotherapy or combined with ursodeoxycholic acid. And we will hear, um, um, we will also see more data on obeticolic acid treatment of PBC later at this meeting. So with respect to pruritus, so interestingly, the maximum severity occurred during the first year. And, um, and then on the right, you can see that it was after one year uh, moderate in many patients. So during the extension phase, six patients discontinued uh, treatment. 
but tolerability overall improved with long-term treatment, and the incidence of new onset pruritus declined after the first year. So it's a common adverse event, but tolerability, uh, tolerability uh, over the in this long-term extension study uh, was was very good and improved. So now I've highlighted the improvements of clinical chemistry in, in the study, and now you might wonder why are these clinical chemical parameters important for PVC patients? And this is um, demonstrated in this uh, large uh, study that looks at the at, um, improvement of transplant-free survival um, using the surrogate markers. And alkaline phosphatase and bilirubin, those two parameters that improve upon treatment with obeticolic acid, they are strongly correlated with increased risk of transplant or liver-related deaths in PBC. So they are so good markers for survival and risk of transplantation. And this has been demonstrated by the global PBC group, which suggested the utility of these enzymatic parameters as surrogate endpoints in PBC. And on the right, you can see the criteria, uh, alkaline phosphatase reduction and reduction of bil uh, and, and bilirubin less than the upper limit of normal were used at the primary endpoint, also in the ongoing studies that will be presented later at this meeting. So the key message is you can use these enzymes and bilirubin levels as surrogate markers for liver-related deaths and risk of transplantation. These post hoc analysis applied the POIS criteria to two phase two PBC obligate colic acid trials. So this um, is the background for using these parameters in ongoing studies. So to conclude, obeticolic colic acid results in a meaningful improvement in attainment of a biochemical response criteria um, which are highly correlated with clinical benefit. Significant improvement was observed when obeticolic colic acid was administered as monotherapy or as add-on to ursa as mentioned. And this was true across a broad range of patient baseline characteristics. So PBC patients are all different. We need stratification and obeticolic acid improved the clinical chemical surrogate parameters uh, across uh, the cohort. Overall, the data support the clinical utility of obeticolic acid in the treatment of PBC, and these voice criteria appear to be useful for judging efficacy in PBC trials. So it is, it, it is an important message how to design trials for PBC, uh, and I think it's very important that we have valid surrogate markers to assess overall survival and to assess the efficacy of these new drugs. So that was the second talk on obeticolic acid, and here's the third one. So again, there's obeticolic acid and uh, FXR, Pharnasoid X receptor, abbreviated FXR. This is a study from Leuven in Belgium. The authors are in the room. And um, here uh, we switch gears a little bit. We do not focus on the liver, but on the intestine. And the reason is that uh, patients with advanced liver disease are at risk of infections, and these infections are one of the major reasons why you die from liver disease. So why do liver patients die from hepatocellular cancer or from infections? And so we would like to protect our patients against infections, and many of these infections um, are caused by bacterial translocation from the intestine. And this is why I show you here an intestine, and you can see that there uh, that this intestine represents a barrier, so there are specific barrier proteins, claudines and others. And then you can also see that FXR regulates barrier functions, including inflammatory markers at this barrier. So it's very important for liver patients with cirrhosis to have an intact intestinal barrier to be protected from infections. So the group in, in Leuven now evaluated the effects of obeticolic acid on bacterial translocation, intestinal permeability, and markers of systemic inflammation. This was an experimental study, and it needs to be translated to our patients. So how do you assess bacterial translocation? Well, you look at the lymph nodes in, um, in bile duct ligated rats. So bile duct ligated rats represent a model for cirrhosis, and you can clearly see on the left that the number of bacterial strains is significantly increased in bile duct uh, ligated rats, but then if you add obeticolic acid, INT747, then you can significantly reduce the numbers. So it provides protection. So if your stimulate effects are signaling in the intestine, that um, uh, increases 
or this uh, that uh, inhibits bacterial translocation. And then the authors also looked at tight junction protein expression in the ileum. So remember these tight junction proteins that um, are critical um, elements of the uh, mucosa barrier. And again, they showed that obeticolic acid increases tight junction protein expression and it reduces the inflammatory markers. So to summarize the findings, so obeticolic acid given to patients suffering from PBC who previously had an inequitable response to ERSO produced meaningful biochemical and clinical improvements. And obeticolic acid generates a highly significant improvement in the biochemical response criteria as defined, and these are associated with improved transplant-free survival. Obeticolic acid treatment also resulted in double improvement in alkaline phosphatase and other liver chemistry over this long-term extension period. And then experimental setup for the last study, it might also be helpful to keep ileal permeability and to decrease bacterial translocation. And from this you can anticipate that we will see more clinical studies translating these very exciting findings uh, uh, into clinics. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to briefly mention one study on hepatitis delta. It is actually the biggest study ever done on the treatment of chronic hepatitis delta. I just want to underline that delta hepatitis, you don't hear much about it as you hear, for, for, for example, from hepatitis B or hepatitis C, but it is the most severe form of chronic viral hepatitis. It is associated, associated with the highest frequency of complications to occur during the natural course of uh, delta hepatitis compared to other, uh, other chronic viral hepatitis, and it is important in that context. On the other hand, it is, of course, uh, a relief that delta hepatitis was granted orphan status in Europe and the US. So it's a r rather rare disease. The hotspots in Europe are Albania, Romania, and Turkey, where I come from. And in Turkey, it's, it's not evenly distributed. It's more in the southeastern part and eastern part. So having said that, the study is uh, an investigator-initiated study, so it's not a pharmaceutical company-initiated study, which shows that uh, it's, it's a rare disease, uh, with the participation of centers from Germany, uh, Romania, Greece, and Turkey. And uh, so basically, we had a two groups, one group received peglet interferon alpha 2A with tenofovir, and the other group received peglet interferon alpha 2A plus placebo. They were treated for two years, for 96 weeks, after which there was a follow-up without treatment of six months. The reason why this treatment was continued for two years and not for one year was that we had, the, in the HIDIT-1 study, the study was for one year, and the question was, could response to treatment, biologic response to treatement, increased by uh, extending the duration of treatment. Now, these are the results in terms of virologic response, which is, uh, undetectable delta virus RNA. You can see the, the yellow bar is peglet interferon with tenofovir, and the white is peglet interferon with placebo. There was no difference in terms of virologic response at one year of treatment and at two year of treatment. You, you can, of course, see that numerically Peglet interferon tenofovir combination therapy appears to be better, but there was no statistical difference. And by end of follow-up, the numbers were became closer. Uh, Thirty percent uh, uh, response, biologic response in those with 
combination treatment and 23% response in those with monotherapy. And what is very disappointing is the high rate of relapse once treatment was discontinued despite the long duration of treatment with painted interferon. There, I want to mention one other thing, and uh, or let's focus first on the ALT response, so biochemical response. As you can see, very similar, numerically a little bit higher uh, response rates uh, with pegylid interferon tenofovir combination, but overall there was no difference in terms of uh, biochemical response between the two treatment groups and more the biochemical response rates more or less followed uh, the biological response rates. Now what, I, what is not shown here is uh, the response in terms of surface antigen clearance because that is the ultimate uh, or uh, expected real response in hepatitis B and also in delta hepatitis. I, I did forget to tell you that hepatitis delta presents a disease only in the presence of a patient who has hepatitis B. So it's hepatitis B plus delta. So the ideal endpoint is surface antigen clearance, and in terms of surface antigen clearance, there were only six patients who cleared surface antigen, and that was again evenly distributed. And uh, in terms of quantitative surface antigen levels, there was a slight drop, but again, there was no difference between the two treatment groups. So in summary, this study has shown that pegylid interferon alpha 2A and tenofovir is safe in hepatitis delta. Uh, it was <coughs> well tolerated. Combination treatment showed numerically high rates of on-treatment delta virus RNA suppression, but similar effects on surface antigen reduction as compared to uh, monotherapy. I did not show the data, but there was surprisingly a significant difference uh, in patients who have advanced liver disease compared to mild disease. So liver patients who had liver cirrhosis were as uh, had a high response uh, rate. The study has sh also shown that surface antigen levels, on treatment surface antigen levels, and maybe on treatment delta virus RNA levels, may be predictive of response. And uh, as I said, the disappointing result was that more than one third of patients who had a response at end of treatment relapsed after treatment discontinuation. Good morning. <coughs> my, my task is to bring you uh, to the more advanced uh, phases of uh, the disease of cirrhosis, cirrhosis and portal hypertension. And uh, the first uh, study which has been selected to be <coughs> presented today is related to a potential new predictor of outcome in these patients. And uh, that is neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin, which is a, which is a protein that uh, belongs to the <coughs> lipocalin superfamily and was uh, uh, initially found in uh, activated neutrophils. But then uh, further research have shown that uh, this uh, protein can be expressed by many tissue and mainly by uh, tubular cells in the kidney. And uh, for this reason, uh, the production and release of NGAL, along with other molecules that are expressed when these tubular cells are damaged, <coughs> uh, like kidney, um, kidney injury molecular molecule one, uh, I would say the, the production and release of these molecules by renal tubular cells, it has become a biomarker of renal damage in different settings. Very interestingly, uh, in the general population of hospitalized patients, NGAL predicts uh, uh, the occurrence of kidney failure, as it could be expected, 
but also a very heavy endpoint, that is mortality. And uh, little is known about the power of NGAL to predict mortality in cirrhosis. And uh, uh, having uh, predictors of outcome in cirrhosis, and especially in particular settings, as in acute and chronic liver failure, is of paramount importance. Because this allows us to identify patients who have an unexpected adverse outcome, and we can set a sort of treatment more apt to this patient or think about an urgent liver transplantation. And this is the context where this study has been done. Uh, the urinary excretion of NGAL uh, has been studied in patients with decompensated cirrhosis who had been hospitalized because of the occurrence of complication and uh, some of them also had developed acute and chronic liver failure. And the cohort of patients studied in this case belongs to the cohort enrolled in the canonic study, which is a study which has already been done by the Chronic Liver Failure Consortium, uh, which involves several centers in Europe and enrolled uh, more than 1,000 patients. And uh, analyzed uh, uh, for the study were 716 patients uh, where the urinary excretion of NGAL and uh, uh, kidney injury molecule urine was dosed. Uh, looking at the predictive power uh, as far as 20-day mortality was concerned, 90-day mortality was concerned, and the occurrence of acute and chronic liver failure which is an entity characterized by the occurrence of extrahepatic organ failure. And according to the number of organ, extrahepatic organ failure we have, mortality increases. Uh, a first result, a first important result, that uh, NGAL and the kidney injury molecule one were related to 20-day mortality, but only NGAL was independently associated with these events, along with MELD. You know that MELD is a score system uh, that predicts a, a, a short, medium-term mortality in patients and leukocyte count. Importantly, the addition of NGAL to MELD was able to increase the predictive uh, ability of MELD, as is shown by this uh, receiver operator curve. Similar results were obtained as far as 90-day mortality was concerned. And again, NGAL was an independent predictor of the occurrence of acute and chronic liver failure, along with MELD, hepatic encephalopathy, and serum sodium. So MELD is a strong predictor of outcome in these patients. Interestingly, and expectedly, there was a significant correlation between the level of urinary NGAL and the level of serum creatinine, as NGAL is released mainly by renal, we think that is released by renal tubular cells. But the important things emerging from this study it is that more than one third of patients actually had increased NGAL in their urine without the sign of renal failure. So possibly NGAL is coming out from other tissues, and there is evidence that in addition to tubular cells, NGAL comes out from activated leukocytes, and inflammation and sepsis are very important in the prognosis of patients with, <coughs> with advanced cirrhosis, and possibly they are also coming out from the liver, and we have some evidence from initial evidence for that. The second study we, we have selected, uh, as you can see from the title, is an important perspective because we are speaking about improving survival in cirrhosis. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, portal hypertension is a major feature of cirrhosis of the liver, and uh, portal hypertension is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality in these patients. 
And we know that if we are able to reduce portal hypertension to a target level, which is below 12 millimeters of mercury, or anyway, a we obtain a reduction of at least 20% from baseline value, we are able to improve the occurrence of complication linked to portal hypertension, bleeding, ascites, and so on. Well, at present, uh, our approach to the treatment of portal hypertension is based on non-selective beta blocker associated or not with organic nitrates. This is an effective treatment, but we shouldn't forget that uh, the target reduction is achieved uh, in about half of cases. So half of cases do not respond to this treatment. 15% of cases present contraindication to the use of beta blocker and roughly another 15% develop side effects that lead to the withdrawal of the treatment. So the search for alternative or complementary treatment is of paramount importance in this setting. And uh, finally, I would like to recall that portal pressure <coughs> is function of blood flow blood incoming towards the liver, and resistance, resistance within the liver. Well, the, with the beta blockers, we are able to influence blood flow. And as far as the resistance is concerned, we have two components, a structural component, which accounts about for two-thirds for resistance, which is linked to the extensive fibrosis and nodular formation in this patient, and little, we, we can do very little in this respect. But one third is a dynamic component, dynamic component is characterized by the involvement of many cell types, and in particular, statins, which are the subject uh, of uh, this study, are able to influence the nitroglycide metabolism in the sinusoidal epithelia, so uh, increasing blood flow and reducing resistance. This study explored the addition of sylvastatin to standard medical treatment, that means beta blockers, plus or minus nitrates, uh, in order to um, evaluate the, its effect on variceal bleeding and survival. It was a double-blind uh, uh, control clinical trial uh, that involved 14 centers in Spain. Almost 160 patients were enrolled. Uh, um, they had to initiate standard prophylaxis, secondary prophylaxis, that means to prevent various re variceal re-bleeding. They were stratified according to the severity of the disease, staged according to the child pool classification, and they received uh, or standard medical treatment, or standard medical treatment plus simvastatin, uh, uh, with a titrating dose from 20 to 40 milligrams per day. The follow-up lasted two years. The primary endpoint was a composite uh, uh, endpoint, uh, that means re-bleeding and death, uh, and uh, the, the secondary endpoints were either death or re-bleeding. Very shortly, <coughs> uh, Apparently, the administration, the, the association of simvastatin to the uh, standard medical treatment uh, didn't uh, lower the occurrence of re-bleeding in this patient. But very importantly, addition of simvastatin to the standard medical treatment was associated with an improvement in survival, which uh, was mostly, and I would say expectedly, evident in patient with uh, less advanced cirrhosis, that means A, B, with respect to C patients. Therefore, the, these results suggest that the simvastatin in these patients is making something else. It's not only modulating portal pressure, but possibly is influencing other, uh, other process. And I, I would like to single out from the conclusion of the author the fact that uh, we have evidence that simvastatin uh, is able to attenuate liver inflammation and liver injury associated with bleeding. 
And uh, in non-cirrhotic patient, simvastatin uh, is able to protect from my hypoxia hepatitis and my attenuated vasectomy syndrome, which is relevant considering the patient with advanced cirrhosis have a long-standing, low-profile, but consistent pro-inflammatory state. The conclusion is straightforward, and there is the invitation to, the, 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 mm, it, it invites to, to, to include uh, simvastatin in the standard care for secondary prophylaxis of a recent